we're at the beautiful Trout Lake in the Upper Peninsula. The sun's setting. I hear the birds. Oh, what's that you say? Why am I in Trout Lake and not in the Straits? Well, guess what? Soon I'll be paddling down the Lake Huron to the Straits of Mackinac because this is the Life of the Straits program. So welcome everyone to the Life of the Straits program. If this is your first time, this is a program put on by MSU Extension, Michigan State University that is, and the, it's a part of the 4-H program and Michigan Sea Grant. We've got a great team that's gonna put on some awesome stuff for you. You're gonna learn a little bit about watersheds. You're gonna learn a little bit about uh, the inland waterways. And then we're gonna have a Q&A and for the first time this week, a really great fun family friendly activity that you can do at home and you can send us in your results. So our team here uh, is myself, I'm Elliot Nelson based in Chippewa County. We've got Susan Kirkman in Mackinac County. She's the 4-H coordinator there. We've got Leanne Thena, who, uh, who is the Chip Sheboygan County 4-H coordinator. And we've got Kaylee Fessler from Presque Isle County 4-H coordinator. So if you're in any of those counties, you can look us up. Uh, but we are glad to have you here from all across the state of Michigan and outside of the state of Michigan. Uh, so back to what I was saying, we're going to investigate today a little bit about the uh, the Straits of Mackinac and how it is that I could be on an inland lake and that could somehow connect to the Great Lakes and to the Straits of Mackinac. So if we take a look here at the Great Lakes, we can see that um, this is actually all the boundaries of the Great Lakes. Now you might be saying, why is that black line go all the way outside of the Great Lakes? Well, this is a watershed map. And the watershed shows us the between water and land. So basically, any drop of water that falls onto the land anywhere within this black line area, that is going to end up in the Great Lakes. That's right. So that's what a watershed is. It's all the area where water is connected, where the land, any water that gets on the land, ends up into the water bodies within that watershed. Now let's take a little closer look at this since we're talking about the Straits of Mackinac. And just as a reminder, if you're not sure what a strait is, you might just be thinking straight, like, like a straight aerial, like the line that goes right through Mackinac Island or something. Well, actually, it's a nautical definition. Da -da 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 -da. And a nautical definition of the Straits of Mackinac, or a strait, is any narrow stretch of water that connects two larger bodies of water. So you might be saying, where is really the Straits of Mackinac? Well, it's kind of sort of where you make it. But most people would say that the Straits of Mackinac covers this general area right here and the Great Lake stretch that you kind of have to go through to get from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. But I actually say that the Straits of Mackinac really should be the entire area around here. And that's because, like I said before, this is the Straits of Mackinac's watershed. And that means any drop of water that falls into that area inside the blue line ends up in Lake Michigan or Lake Huron. Yeah, so this is really what we could say the Straits of Mackinac is. Now, the Straits of Mackinac watersheds are really fascinating. There's all sorts of amazing things inside of them. Akiak, which is one of the most fun things to say ever, uh, has an amazing waterfall. It's one of the best and one of the few only waterfalls in the lower peninsula of Michigan. It's publicly accessible. There's a great park there. So go check that out if you get a chance. Akiak Falls. Drummond Island has got its own watershed all on the water, all on that island. And guess what? In that island is a chain of four lakes. That's right. There's lakes inside of an island on a lake. It's a lake within a lake, it's like inception, it's crazy. But those lakes are named First Lake, Second Lake, Third Lake, and Fourth Lake. Really creative naming, but it's really cool because you can paddle from the big Lake Huron all the way up through those four chain of lakes. Over uh, the other side, we've got Car the Carp Watershed, Carp River Watershed, and that is actually a nationally designated wild and scenic river. It's a beautiful water uh, river that's hardly touched by any humans, and it's got all sorts of great fishing in there. And finally, the Pine Watershed is another really big watershed in there, um, and that's almost completely within a national forest. 
There's other small coastal watersheds, but then of course, there's the big one, the giant watershed. And today, we're gonna really dive into that with Leanne. So, Leanne, <laughs> if you're there, are you out there somewhere? Hi, everybody. It's All good right. to have you here tonight. And we are going to talk about the Sheboygan watershed and a specific portion of that one of my favorite places called the Inland Waterway. And I'm wearing my boat hat. I'm sorry I don't have a cool background like Elliot does. I'm in my office, but I still felt like if we're going to talk about the Inland Waterway, I need to have my cool hat on because when my family goes out on the Inland Waterway, we love to look for turtles. And so I wear my turtle hat specifically for that. So, all right, let's get started as I talk more with you about this awesome place called the Inland Waterway. All right, so we are blessed to be surrounded by an abundance of water. No point in Michigan is more than six miles from an inland lake or stream or more than 85 miles from one of these amazing Great Lakes. So Michigan's abundant fresh water supports tourism. It supplies clean water for us people, agriculture for our animals and our plants and for manufacturing. And it overall makes our life a whole lot better. So in this, again, you're seeing the whole big Michigan watershed that Elliot was showing us a little at the beginning. Um, and just a reminder, Michigan has 3,288 miles of Great Lakes coastline. That is pretty amazing. So here it is. This is the Sheboygan watershed. It is huge. So uh, as I was learning more about watersheds, I came across this quote from the Herb Family Foundation and I really loved it. They said, we like to say everyone lives on waterfront property. This is because everything people do on their land, no matter if it's located on a river or lake or not at all, everything we do ends up in one of the Great Lakes. So it's important for us to understand what the Herb family meant and to be able to look at the inland waterway and the bigger watershed that it is a part of. All right, so here is the Sheboygan watershed. All of this inside my red line is a part of the Sheboygan watershed. This is a huge area. It goes from Petoskey all the way over to Sheboygan. This is like 60 miles and then not quite to Mackinac City, a little south of Mackinac City, almost all the way to Gaylord. This is a huge area. But on this map, it's only showing you like the basic rivers. It's not showing you all of it. So let me show you another map that's going to show you all of the different um, rivers and streams that are a part of this. So look at all those, there are so many and then you can see all the different lakes. So that is a huge watershed. So what is a watershed? So basically a watershed, it starts with the land. It's all the high parts of the land form the outside edge of a watershed. Um, and it's like the edges of a bowl, right? And then as the land catches the rain or as the snow melts off, it's funneling all the water down towards a single river. This is known as a watershed of that river. So typically the watershed is named after that river. But in the case of the Sheboygan watershed, we'll go back to this. This is actually a drainage basin because it contains many rivers and lakes that all send their water to the Straits of Mackinac. So all of this area ends up down here where the star is. All right, I wanna to introduce to you my friend. Hopefully you can see my picture. This is my good friend, Rubber Ducky. And I, Rubber Ducky wanted to go on a little fun experience. So he explored the Sturgeon River watershed. So let's see what Rubber Ducky was up to. So typically a river begins in a higher area of land where the rain waters and spring waters collect in a wetland or a pond or a gully. In this case, Rubber Ducky is taking a nice little float and swim in a spring fed pond. So this pond has been formed because the owners created an earth dam. So when we scroll over to the other side over here, you're gonna see where the road is running. That's actually a dam. 
And then they made it so that the overflow from those ponds flows into this nice little stream. Look at how nice Mr. Rubber Ducky is floating along in this nice stream. Well, this stream catches up and joins with another stream, which then eventually joins in with a wetland and finally flows out into the Sturgeon River. So when Ducky gets to the Sturgeon River, we're gonna pick up with him a little later at that point. Rubber Ducky had a nice little float. All right, so as we talk about the Inland Waterway, it's good to remember that the names are gonna change of the rivers and the lakes, but that this is all still flowing into the Straits of Mackinac. So why is this important? Well, remember the statement that we all live on the waterfront? So see this yellow star up here? This is kind of where Rubber Ducky started off in his pond. And that's where I live, right? I live up that way. I'm like 30 miles away from Sheboygan. But if I were to pour chemicals on my lawn, like weed killer and fertilizer and put too much on, when it rains, the runoff from that rain will most likely make it all the way down into the piles, those ponds, which feed into the Sturgeon River, which feed all the way down into the Straits of Mackinac. Well, those chemicals, if there's enough of them, can cause problems for animal fish and us as humans. Well, you may be thinking, it's just me. I'm just one person doing that. It's no big deal. But if all of my neighbors along here do the same thing, imagine the amount of chemicals and stuff that would be in our now beautiful, pristine, clean water. So it's important for us to all understand how what we do can impact a watershed, which could also impact our Great Lakes. And we want to make sure that our beautiful, abundant water stays really great. All right, so I want to talk to you also about one more aspect of a watershed, and that's springs. So there are two types of springs. Oh, and a spring is basically where water naturally flows out of the ground. They're pretty cool. Um, so there's two types. So, you know, rubber ducky is here floating in this pond. This is actually called a seepage spring. Around this are big, tall hills. And so the water seeps down and gathers in this pond. So it kind of looks like this. We're on a lot of sand. So as it rains, the rain comes and accumulates and it pours down into this low area. So a seepage spring is usually going to be found where there's loose soil or rock in lands where there's depressions or valleys. So like these ponds were down in the valley. So that's a seepage spring. I also want to talk to you about one other spring that we find here in northern Michigan, Michigan quite often. And we're going to let Rubber Ducky introduce this one. So this spring that Rubber Ducky is hanging out in is called an artesian spring. These springs come from pressure. So the water is in a confined aquifer and the ground is pressing on it. And there might be a crack that forms that pushes the water through up um, out of the ground. So it's like the big squeeze. So this water is being squeezed underground and it's pushing it up and out so it flows in a big stream like that. That spring is actually found uh, in a lanson. Um, and the health department actually tests that water to make sure that it's good and healthy. Uh, so lots of people will stop there and get their drinking water from that natural spring. So it's kind of a cool place. So that's an artesian spring. And here's a picture of kind of what this would look like. So up at the top of the hill, it's raining. The rain gets into the ground. It gets into this aquifer, which is like an area that contains it. There's impermeable labor, layers, I'm sorry, impermeable layers. So that could be rock, it could be clay, any kind of soil that the water can't get through. And then for some reason, it gets disturbed and there ends up being a break in it. And then the water can come shooting out of the ground in that artesian spring. So just like we saw, it was coming out really fast. Some people will choose to put a pipe down into that um, same water, the aquifer where the water is, and have it come up the pipe and out. Um, and so that's called an artesian well because they actually drilled a pipe down into it. So that's a pretty cool thing that we have here in Michigan. All right, I have a question for you. How many of you uh, have ever had a bottle of natural spring water? 
couple of us have done it at some point. Even me, I have bought water that said that it came, it was natural spring water. Well, I'm really sorry, you guys. I have to be the truth buster in this. Um, so actually, there are not enough natural spring sources to supply the enormous bottled water industry. So most likely your natural spring water is not actually natural spring water. So, you know, springs are an important part of our water cycle and our ecosystems, but they're actually somewhat rare. So they're hard to find. And so we're really fortunate to have them here. Okay, so we've learned about a watershed and how understanding the big picture is important, so that we know how our water all flows down into the Straits of Mackinac and how we all live on waterfront. And we've now learned that one of the ways water can come out of the ground is through a spring. And sometimes those springs will all come together, just like our seepage pond, that spring-fed pond, and it could flow into our river. In some cases, it could be the birthplace of a river. Now, we're gonna talk about my favorite place, and actually, it's a big, long place called the Inland Waterway. So here's a big picture of it. So the Inland Waterway starts just like a mile shy of Lake Michigan, and it runs, so Crooked Lake is the beginning of it, and it runs all the way across the tip of Michigan. You can see where these red dots are. It runs all the way across into Lake Huron. It's a pretty amazing thing. And until I moved here, I had no idea that it was here. I could talk for six weeks every week about the Inland Waterway. There are so many cool things about it, but I'm just gonna give you an overview today. I will try to restrain myself. Um, there are so many cool parts. All right, so we are gonna pick up on Rubber Ducky's journey. Um, and so I put down here on the map the red stars. So this is where the Sturgeon River comes into Burt Lake and we went through Indian River. So Sturgeon River, Burt Lake, into Indian River. I sped this video up because it took us 45 minutes to give Rubber Ducky a ride on our boat. Oh yeah, and by the way, uh, my dog Tank makes a few guest appearances on it as well, but no fear, Rubber Ducky was safe and sound. Um, so he was not harmed at all in our traveling along this trip. So this video is actually took us 45 minutes. So just so you know, we go super fast in the video, but when you do it for real, it's not that fast. And while we travel the Inland Waterway, I'm gonna tell you more about it. So we are starting in the Sturgeon River. So remember, rubber ducky started off in the ponds, went to the streams, went through a wetland, came out into the river, and now we're getting towards the end of the Sturgeon River we're going to head into Black Lake. All right, so we are traveling in on the Inland Waterway. This is Michigan's longest chain of rivers and lakes. It's 38.2 miles long. It has three rivers and three lakes. It almost crosses the entire tip of northern Michigan. I already said it starts just one mile east of Lake Michigan. So like roads help cars get from one place to not another, this is a waterway. It's basically a road for boats. So we are now coming out of the Sturgeon River and we are entering into Burt Lake. Well, you'll learn more about Burt Lake in a, middle, in a minute. So the Inland Waterway, it was originally used by the Native Americans. This is how they would get across from the west side of the state to the east side or the east side to the west side and be able to avoid going through the Straits of Mackinac because the Straits of Mackinac, they could be unpredictable and treacherous and turbulent sometimes. And the waterway was safe and calm and easy to do. The waterway was also used by fur traders. And then later on, the lumber industry used it to float trees down to sawmills and steamer ships in Sheboygan. All right, we are now entering, leaving Burnt Lake and entering into Indian River. So originally portions of the inland waterway were really shallow and swampy. But in 1860, the natural streams and rivers that connected the lake were enlarged and straightened and deepened so that they could accommodate steamships. So the Inland Waterway now can handle boats up to 60 feet, 65 feet long with a five foot draft, so it could be five foot deep into the water. However, and you'll see this when we look at Crooked River, oh, there was ink. Um, Crooked River has lots of turns. So those boats, the best, the longest you could should probably have is a 25 foot boat there. All right. 
So the completion of the lot in Sheboygan in 1869 really opened up the Inland Waterway to steamships that would carry passengers and freight up through the Inland Waterway to different locations. And then the railroad came along and that was actually faster than the Inland Waterway. But this still is a popular place for day long excursions where tourists can come in and just enjoy time floating on the river. So the Inland Waterway is also a popular place to fish. There are 17 species of fish inhabitants that the waterway, oh sorry, inhabit the waterway. So there's 17 species of fish. Those are bluegill, brown trout, largemouth bass, northern pike, rainbow trout, smallmouth bass, steelhead, walleye, and yellow perch. So we are still in Indian River, coming towards the outskirts of Indian River. The Inland Waterway, most of the rivers are no wake. So it's good to know that because we're moving along really fast, but in real life, it would not be this fast. To get from one side to do the full 38.2 miles will take you an entire day. From sun up to sun down, going one way. The cool thing is there's some different hotels where you can actually pull your boat up right alongside the hotel and tie up and walk right up and be able to get a room. So lots of people will do that. They will go one direction, stay in a hotel overnight, and then the next day they'll come back the other direction. Or a lot of times you see there's a lot of homes along this. Some of those are for rent. So some people will rent a home and that way then they can slowly explore the inland waterway and check it out without trying to fit it all into one day. But there's a lot to see. It's pretty amazing. All right, we are coming up on the bridge that crosses over the river. This is Interstate 75. And actually, shortly after this is when our trip ends and we turned around because this was 45 minutes in and the sun was starting to set on us. So we had to get back home and off the water. So was that pretty fun to get a little taste of the inland waterway? Rubber Ducky was able to travel a lot faster on our boat than he would have if he had just let him float. All right, so we're gonna slow down because that was fast. And we are gonna talk about some different points along the inland waterway. All right, so we are gonna go back. We're gonna go in the direction that the water flows. So the water starts over here in Crooked Lake, and again, flows down this whole watershed basin into the Straits of Mackinac. So we're gonna start where the water starts, at the top, right? So this is Crooked Lake. Crooked Lake is considered the headwaters. So the beginning place, the start of the inland waterways. This is actually a remnant of the post-glacial -glacier, lake Nipissing. Its convoluted shape is the outcome of the glacier cut topography through which its water drains. And actually most of the inland waterway was formed by the glacier. And next to Crooked Lake, you'll see is Pickerel Lake. And actually Pickerel Lake, uh, they formed a channel from Pickerel Lake into Crooked Lake. So it is one of the smallest lakes on the Inland Waterway. It's nestled between the State Forest and Emmett County farmland. Um, and it's really known, if you're a fisher person, it is known for great walleye and pike fishing. Uh, the sandy bottom of this lake is great for swimming. And the lake is definitely large enough for any kind of water sports. So if you wanted to ski, um, if you wanted to run a jet ski, you can definitely do all of that. So as we leave Crooked Lake, we are heading towards the town of Alanson. We are gonna come into a lock because between Crooked Lake, when they dredged out Crooked River, the Crooked River is much lower than the lake and there's a drop there. So they had to install a lock so that boats could go from one to the other where there's a change. So this is what it kind of looks like. You go from Crooked Lake you see the lock is straight ahead. There's a spillway, so that water is dropping one to three feet depending on the water level. Uh, and so to make it safe for boats to pass through, they have to go through this lock. So the lock was built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, and again, it's to help boats, it raises and lowers boats one to three feet. And I have a fun little video so you can kind of see what this looks like. This lock is called a clam lock. And the doors open up you'll see it looks like a big clam opening up. So here we are heading into the lock. See the door up overhead? That will come down. So you go underneath the door. It comes down. 
We're going to talk more specifically about how a lock works when we get to the Sheboygan lock. So that's the front door that's closed right now. Takes a few minutes to lower the water level and now the front is opening. See the big clamshell going up? Out of the way. And now it's safe for the boats to continue on into the river. You might get a little drip down when you go under that. <laughs> Very cool. All right, so that's, that's the lock at a Lanson. Now, the next thing that you hit as you go on the Inland Waterway is the swing bridge in a Lanson. You know, people had to get from one side of the river to the other, so they had to have a bridge, right? So there's the swing bridge. Now, I thought it'd be fun for you guys to see a little bit of what this looks like in action too. And I'm gonna actually speed this up a little because it, the bridge only opened a certain time, so it took a little while for it to open. So here, we'll speed up to where it opened. So this bridge is really low to the river. You can see just the jet skis fit under. So most boats don't fit under this. So they have to wait. And I think they open it on the hour for the swing, swing bridge to open. See how it's pivoting on that point? This is actually the world's smallest operating swing bridge. It's just one lane to go across this bridge. Now it's open and boats can go through. So next up on our tour of the Inland Waterway is Crooked River. And just like it sounds, it is a crooked river. <laughs> so you can see if you look towards the top of the screen, look at all those curves in this river. So if you remember, I mentioned earlier that boats, the Inland Waterway could fit boats up to 65 feet, but in this part of the Inland Waterway, I would recommend you don't go over 25 feet, especially when you get to Devil's Elbow. That is a tough little curve to go around. So it's good to have a smaller boat to get around it. Crooked River is 5.6 miles. So from Crooked Lake all the way to Burt Lake is 5.6 miles. So next up is Burt Lake. This is a very large lake. You saw it in our video on our boat ride. Um, we were just at the one corner of it. So Burn Lake covers a surface area of 17,000 acres. So it's 10 miles long from north to south and about five miles at its widest point. It's named after William A. Burt, who together with John Mullet made a federal survey of the area in 1840 to 1843. So I guess if you're surveying the land and you find a lake, you get the privilege of na naming it after yourself. So thus came the name of Burt Lake. Um, so this uh, natural body of water features 33 miles of shoreline and it has an average depth of 23 feet. And the deepest spot in the lake is 73 feet deep. And I can tell you, because my husband and I like to fish this lake, it is really great for rainbow and brown trout bass and one of my favorites, walleye. Mm, yum, yum, yum. Nothing like a walleye over a fire. It's great. So that's Burnt Lake. Great place to go to fish. Now from Burnt Lake, we go into Indian River. So again, you saw Indian River uh, when we gave Rubber Ducky a ride. This is the heart of the Inland Waterway. So the yellow star is where we started with Rubber Ducky, where we picked him up in the Sturgeon River. We came out into a little bit of Burnt Lake and then up into Indian River and we stopped and turned around just past the bridge for uh, Interstate 75. So again, that took us 45 minutes to do on our boat, even though the video was only like three minutes and 50 seconds. Um, the whole thing took 45 minutes. And then from the bridge all the way out to Mullet Lake, that takes another hour because there's so much winding and turning and you have to go super slow. It's a no wake area with the boat. You have to go slow. And that's to protect all of the wildlife that's a part of the marsh through that area. So back in Indian River, if you saw there was a lot of houses and stuff along the way, when you get down into the heart of Indian River, there's actually public boat parking. And you can park your boat 
and you can get off and go up and walk into town um, and stop and get a bite to eat or get some yummy ice cream or I would highly recommend Drost chocolate, D-R-O-S-T chocolate. Um, they have ice cream too, but their chocolate is amazing. They make it from scratch. So if you're in Indian River and you're on the inland waterway, park your boat, go to Drost, get some great chocolate. All right, after Indian River, we head into the fifth largest inland lake, and this is Mullet Lake. So the fifth largest inland lake in Michigan. It's a beast. It's good size. So this lake covers 26 square miles. It has 28 miles of shoreline. It is 10 miles wide for its or length. Its length is 10 miles. It's about four miles wide at its width. And this one, this lake is deep. It's 120 feet deep. So what that means is in the wintertime when the water gets cold, it takes a long time for this lake to get ice on it because it's so deep. So it takes a while for it to freeze over. If this is also where the state record Lake Sturgeon was caught. So and there's also a lot of other really awesome fish in this lake. So next up, we're on to the Sheboygan River. So the Sheboygan River is seven miles in length. Um, Sheboygan is actually an Indian name that means through passage. The Indians preferred to use this passage um, more than going around the straits because the straits would be so turbulent. Um, and it was also used for logs, floating logs down, and also for fur trading. You will also notice the Black River joins in at this point, which is a whole nother watershed that comes into this area. We're not going to go over the Black River, but you could take a right and go up the Black River with your boat if you wanted to. And there's some great areas to actually water ski up through the Black River. But we're going to continue on down the river towards the Straits. And we're going to stop in an area that I think is amazingly cool. This is the Sheboygan Lock and Dam area. This is actually in the town of Sheboygan. Um, it's a really well-kept secret, so um, I'm gonna unlock the secret and let you guys know about it. So this is a great picture of it. You'll see on the right is the dam and the spillway. So that's where the water goes from the dam. If you keep going straight ahead, you'll see the lock is straight ahead. And then on the left side, there's that big gray building. It's actually a building. Great big gray block is a building. Um, and there's three little red dots. That's actually a hydroelectric turbine is in that building. And that, they let the water go through that and it creates electricity that helps run that factory. And it's super important because that factory, they make toilet paper. And we all know how important toilet paper is. So it's kind of cool that the Sheboygan River helps us get toilet paper. So important water source. <laughs> All right, we're gonna look a little more at the dam. So this is a picture of the dam. The dam actually controls the level of the Sheboygan River and Mullet Lake. So remember how I said at the beginning, before they dredged things out, there, some things weren't passable. Well, the Sheboygan River before the dam was installed was just a little tiny stream. But when they put the dam in and back the water up, it made it something substantial. So this dam is really an important piece of infrastructure. At the beginning of the river, um, way back at Mullet Lake, there is a cool gauge that they have in the water that says what level the water is. And the Michigan DNR is responsible for monitoring that water level. And they have a field office in Sheboygan. And in the office, via satellite, there's a, there's a readout that tells us what the level of the water is at the mouth of the Sheboygan River and at Mullet Lake. So that staff person is responsible to make sure that that water level stays consistent. And they'll adjust the open and close the gates on the dam. So you see there's one open where there's water flowing through. If you look to the right of that, there are five more gates or doors that could be open to let water go through. So that person is responsible for if the water's too high, they got to open more gates to let more water run through. If the water's too low, they're going to close gates to back the water up more. So remember the watershed? Remember that whole big area? Remember Crooked Lake all the way up back 60 miles from Sheboygan? Well, this person has to watch the weather all the way over there because if they have a major rainstorm over there, 
even if it's not raining in Sheboygan, they need to know about it because all that water is going to come down the inland waterway and it's going to gather here at the dam. So sometimes they have to work ahead of time and, and maybe drop a little extra water out in preparation for water coming from the other side of the state. So that person, they have to not only watch the weather in their town, they got to watch the weather across the whole watershed so that they can pay attention to what the water levels are doing. And here's a really cool fact. They actually, in November, lower the water level in the river and Mullet Lake by several feet. And then they leave it down all the way through the winter months and then don't bring it back up until all the ice is melted off. They do that so that there's less ice damage to the shorelines and to the um, people's property. That's pretty cool that they can control that. So that's a cool thing about the, the dam and how they can do it. Um, another thing about the dam is that it's a natural barrier. So animals, like the invasive species like sea lamprey, can't get past the dam. There's no fish ladder, there's no way. So it's kind of a nice natural barrier and protects the rest of the river system. All right, let's talk about the lock. I'm running out of time and this is so cool. All right, I'm gonna show you a video of what it looks like to go through the Sheboygan lock. So the Sheboygan Lock, um, it will drop, boats will drop gently, gently, gently lower boats, um, anywhere from 15 to 17 feet. So again, it just kind of depends on what the water level is. So as you can see, this boat is now going into the lock. They have the gates open here on the end so that they can drive in. They're in the upstream. So this is 17 feet higher than what it will be at the bottom. So if any of you have ever been to the Big Sioux Locks up in Sault Ste. Marie, this is dropping the same amount. So from the top to the bottom, the boats are being lowered the same amount as the big ships up in the Sault Ste. Marie. And so I like to call this our little mini Sault Ste. Marie experience. And the cool thing is you get to go in and actually experience it if you have your boat. So you can see they're in, there's these black ropes on the side. They're actually covered with vinyl. Oh, they're closing the doors. And this will seal this off from the rest of the river. These are big, huge doors. They're so wide, you can walk across the top of them. Pretty cool. Now, this is like a big bathtub. So they're gonna slowly drain the water out of this. And these boats are gonna slowly go down 17 feet. Again, they're having the Sault Ste. Marie Locks mini experience. It takes a little while because they slowly do it. See how they're starting to drop? So an interesting fact about Sheboygan is, and it was settled in 1845 by Mr. McLeod. He was the one who built the first Sheboygan Dam on the river. At that time in 1898, Sheboygan had a population exceeding 8,000. Right now, our today's population, we're at about 5,000. So the town was actually bigger back then than it is now. And part of that was because of the lumbering operations. It was immense. Um, and it stayed in operation until 1870, wait, sorry, nope. It was in operation since 1875, so for quite a while. Here you see they're opening the lower doors. So those boats have now gone down 17 feet. See how big those doors are? And they are now out on the lower part of the river. And they will go back out. And they'll close the doors, fill it back up and take the next boats. All right, this is how a lock works. So like I said, you can see the little tugboat at the top. See A, the doors are open, it's coming in. B, those doors are closed. So see the difference in the level of the water between inside the lock and the downstream part? And you can see D, there's a valve down there that they have closed off so that the water doesn't flow down out of the lock. Again, it's like a bathtub where you plug the, put a plug in so that the water will stay in. Once the boat is in, they close A, they close those doors. They, and then C, see where C is? They close that valve so we can't have more water. It's like the faucet on your bathtub. They close off the faucet so we don't get more water into our bathtub. And then they open up D, they open up, they unplug the drain, so that the water will drain out. They use gravity. Gravity helps the water move through. And then when it gets down to the same level as the water on the bottom, they open B, they open up the gates and let the boat go back out. 
And if a goat, boat wants to go upstream, they just reverse the process so that the water will fill back up in the big lock or the big bathroom. All right, so as we continue down the Sheboygan River, we're gonna cross under this cool footbridge that they added a couple years ago to connect downtown to the recreation area on the other side of the river. And then we have to pass under the State Street Drawbridge. This bridge opens once an hour to let boats get through. It's taller than we saw with the swing bridge and the Lanson, so most boats can fit under. But in this case, you're looking at the car ferry that goes out to Bois Blanc Island or Bablo Island out in the Straits. Uh, they have to open it for that boat to get under. And then after that, we get out into the end of the river. So we're heading out into the Straits. That's the big picture. You can see the drawbridge at the very bottom out into the river. It's not far now. And as you head out, you're going to see on the right hand side the United States Coast Guard cutter. This is its home port. This is where it lives. And then to wet your whistle for next week's, Kaylee's going to talk to us about lighthouses. But these are three lighthouses that you will see as you exit the Sheboygan River out into the Straits area. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed your quick overview of the Sheboygan Inland Waterway, this cool way for boats to get all the way across the tip of Michigan. Wow, Leanne, that was fascinating. Such a cool trip through the Inland Waterway and a lot of great information about how land and water and watersheds are all connected. It's all connected. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about all that cool stuff and how could maybe people who are watching learn a little bit more at home. And so I've come up with, or I didn't come up with, I found a great activity from the PBS Kids Plum Landing um, where you can make your own watershed. So you can create your own inland waterway at home with some really simple things. And so I'm going to share how to do that. Cool? So just take a couple minutes and then we'll go over to our Q&A session. So all you really need is a tray. Then you could even do this outside on the concrete or something like that. And then you need to start building some topography. So I got a few pieces of Tupperware here to build a little bit of a mountain. And I'm going to put a little glacial uh, topography there, maybe some little bumpy area. Maybe a few small hills are here and here. Make sure it's all in there. And well, just one more hill over here. All right, now I'm gonna cover that with a piece of plastic. So I just use a garbage bag here that I opened up. Um, but at home, you can use a tarp or anything. And I'm just gonna kind of press that around to create Elliottsville. That's what I'm gonna call this. Elliott County, actually. This is a whole county here. It's Elliott County, and it's now a watershed. And now I can actually explore what happens when it rains. So I'm just going to take a water bottle that I filled with a little bit of green food coloring, just so it shows up a little better on the camera. You can use um, just plain water at home. And I'm just going to say, oh, it rained a little bit. It rained a little bit here. And you can look. That, this is just land here, right? But as that rain starts to fall, that starts to trickle down and starts to form some ponds, maybe some lakes. And the paths between them, like right here, might be a river. Up on this mountain, oh look, we've got a mountain stream forming there. So this is pretty neat. It gives you a chance to see in real time how rain really can all fall into an area. Now there's some really cool explorations you can do with this. <clears throat> let's say somebody built a home up here on top of that beautiful mountain and you know they use a lot of plastic like we all do um, and some of those plastics get out in the land and they start to break down so these are going to represent microplastics that got out on the land and over here this guy here's got a home over there he loves to have a lawn but he didn't really read the directions when he put a bunch of pesticides on his lawn to kill the grubs and now there's a little bit of a buildup of pesticides on his lawn. Now those impact just a pretty small area and maybe one more. We've got folks over here on a road and there's a little bit of an oil spill, a gas leak in one of the cars. Now again, those are just small areas. They're not affecting our ponds, our lakes on here, 
But if it rains again, well, that what is on the land eventually comes into the water. Oh no, oh no, the pesticides got in the lake and all the macrovertebrates are dying and now the perch don't have any food to eat. Oh man, read the directions next time, guy. Don't put too much pesticides down. Oh, what's happening up there? Oh no, the microplastics, they're actually getting right in the split of the watershed. So now we actually end up with microplastics in two different watersheds. Now there's a bunch of plastic on this beach that I like to recreate on. And this one, there's plastic inside the stomachs of one of the herons that live there. And it's starting to cause a problem. <clears throat> Over here, even oil, although oil and water don't mix very well, it can still get moved around eventually and end up in the waterway as well. So there's a fun little activity for you that you can try at home. Uh, there's, there's lots of great expansions for this. There's all sorts of ways that you can make this really cool. I challenge you, if you're watching this, to think about how you can make this at home and how you can do it in a way that's way more creative and better than my little setup here. Maybe get some figurines, maybe do a really big one. Or, you know, if you don't really want to spend the time to set up a real a fake landscape, go outside to your driveway with a bucket of water and pour that water on the driveway and see where it drains to. See how the water flows just on your own driveway or in your own yard. And then you wouldn't even have to set anything up. And it'll teach you a lot about how watersheds are connected. How even though you might not live near water, once it rains, water will move across the land and it will carry things. And that's why we need to be careful to protect our own areas. So um, thank you for joining. We're gonna do a Q&A here in a moment for those of you who wanna stick around a little bit. Um, but just so you know, this watershed activity is from PBS's Plum Landing, and we'll have a link there for you. And you can share your own watershed creations with us. That'd be great. You can email me if you want, or you can join our private Facebook group. And again, uh, we'll email all of you that are registered the link to this group. Also, I believe that uh, we can put that in the chat, or somebody just did put that in the chat for us. So if you look in the chat, the link to the private Facebook group or just those that are registered um, will be. So you could share some cool pictures there. Or like I said, you can email. And so we'll put those links in there and we'll send them an email to you as well as our recordings um, from this week and from last week. So link to the Facebook group and I'll add the link to the um, other activity. Now, our guest speaker is actually, our, our guest Q&A person is actually gonna be Leanne because Leanne, used to work at the locks. That lock that you saw a video of in Sheboygan, she was one of the workers at the locks. Um, so if you have questions right now, um, we'll promote you to panelists and um, you can either turn your videos on or you can uh, just put your questions in the chat. If you have any questions about the inland waterway or the locks, um, feel free to ask away. And we can monitor those in the chat, the Q&A or um, and we can also have Kaylee and, and Susan, if you want to join in too, and you have any questions, go ahead. So yeah, I used to work for the Department of Natural Resources in the Sheboygan field office, and part of my job was running the lock. Um, but a funny story, um, the, the bridge, the State Street bridge that opens, my office was like 10 feet off the river right there by the bridge. And boats used to pull up next to my window because they could see me and they would honk their horn at me and think that I could open the bridge. And so I had to tell them I had no control over the bridge. <laughs> there was another controller that actually sat up in the bridge that would run and open the bridge every hour. So, oh, and the other thing about the lock that I didn't say, it does cost money to go through the lock. So make sure you're prepared yeah. to pay for that. And the lock has a schedule. So you can find that online. You for sure want to look that up because if you come to the lock and it's closed, you are out of luck. And so we've had people in the past that have come from Lake Huron or the Straits up the Sheboygan River, planning to get through the lock to be able to go to their hotel only to find the lock closed. And so then they ended up sleeping on their boat overnight because they didn't read the schedule for the lock and nobody comes to open it when it's closed. So make sure you look those things up and know what that is on. Same thing with the lock, the clam lock over in Alanson on Crooked River and Crooked Lake. That also has a schedule. I'm not sure about the fees for that one because that one's no longer operated by the DNR, but, but make sure you look them up. 
Um, I will share my slide. Some great sources that I used um, that might be helpful for you too if you're planning a trip up this way. I don't see any other questions right now, but I have a question for you, Leanne. Uh, what's the most common kind of boat to go through there? Or is it kayaks or is it motorboats? Are there jet skis? Are there large motorboats, pontoons? What, what kind of boats would go through that lock when you work there? Yes to all of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, probably the most are motor boats that are in like the 25 to 30 foot size and pontoons. We see a lot of pontoons just because the rivers are no wake. Um, so you have to go really slow through a lot of the inland waterway. So that pontoon boats that go really well for that. And you can actually rent pontoon boats and they have the kind that have slides on them. So they have like a second layer to them and you can ride the slide like when you get out in the big lakes you can't do it on the rivers but in the big lakes you can do the slide down so a lot of the local marinas will rent out pontoon boats but yeah um it's really amazing the big boats that come through the lock i've had a boat that has completely filled the lock like it's been that size and there's actually quite a few of them that will come through because they will boat up and down the shoreline of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, and there's lots of places that they'll stay. Um, so yeah, there's big boats that come through. It's pretty amazing. I have another question. What's the biggest fish that you caught on the inland waterway? You said you like to fish in there a lot. <laughs> so I start here, right? This is my fish. <laughs> <laughs> I think my biggest had a 25 inch walleye. I'm not very good at fishing and I'm a fish diva. So that means I don't put my worm or whatever we're using on the hook and I don't take my fish off. I simply cast and reel in. I'm a fish diva. So my husband knew that when he married me. So that's how it works for me for fishing. You got an arrangement. It works. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, what species of fish have you caught on the inland waterway or your husband you and when you're out? Um, walleye, uh, perch, lots of perch, um, bluegills, uh, let's see, rock bass is another one we get quite often, uh, pike, and occasionally we have not caught one, but occasionally people will get a lake surgeon. Mm, wow. Yeah. Now that's a pretty rare species, a threatened species, so you got to make sure you throw that one back if you accidentally catch one, right? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Any other questions for anyone or Kaylee or Susan? Well, I just have one last question then for you. Uh, what's your favorite stretch of the inland waterway and why? That's a hard one. <laughs> it's supposed to be an easy one. You can pick whatever you want. Because <laughs> it depends what you like to do. So Crooked River is a lot of fun because there's most of the rivers are slow no wake but Crooked River has a huge section that is not. So like all those curves it's really fun to spin around those curves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's so great. I think it depends on what you're looking for because I do love um, and I didn't highlight this, but there's some different restaurants along the inland waterway. So it is sometimes fun to go by boat and, you know, tie up and then be able to go eat at a restaurant right off your boat. So, um, so that's a cool part too. So it just kind of depends on what you're looking for. Zeke asked, um, do people kayak the whole way? They, they do. Yep. There are groups and they actually have, um, I think twice a year, there's a kayak race that actually comes down through the Sheboygan River out into the Straits. Um, and I think last year they added going all the way across to Mackinac Island. Wow. So I imagine it would probably take a couple days to kayak that since it takes a whole day just to motor boat it, right? Yeah. And that's the cool thing is there's state parks along the way. So you could easily kayak apart and camp. So like you've got Burt Lake State Park, you have Aloha State Park, and you have Sheboygan State Park. So you could chunk it out into some different chunks and be able to camp in between. You're getting me tempted to <laughs> take my paddle, <laughs> which I do actually have a kayak for, and maybe go doing a little exploring. I know that I've gone on the Sturgeon River on some of the um, whitewater rafting trips or fast 
rat team trips will come. And they even do one in the winter I've done, which is really a, a unique experience to be on the in, on a river in the winter. It was yep. really beautiful and a lot of fun. So hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, listening to some of these awesome facts about the watersheds and the waterways and learned a little bit more about the life of the Straits. We'll see you back next week, the same time, um, same place. And we'll also be getting links out to some of the recordings. So if you want to share these with a few friends, feel free to do that. Have a great night, everyone.